Okay, so I'm going to do some problems that are very similar to what's going to be in our third and final exam for accounting 2022, which is Introduction to Managerial Accounting. And um, if you learn these problems, then you should you should do quite well in the test. There's about 18 problems here. Um, I, some of them I have two or three within a tab, and the test is about 34 total questions so so you'll have um you'll have more than half of the test at least yeah and this is just the problem section um then the conceptual part you simply have to go to the um review that i posted and study the conceptual part of the of the exam and you should you should, you should do fine okay so let's start with these um with these problems and um I'll go through all of them, try to go through all of them um, in one video. So the video should probably be over an hour long. Let's take a look at the first um, first question. It says, Myers Corporation has the following data related to direct materials cost for November. Actual cost for actual cost for 6,000 pounds of material was $5.50 and standard cost for 5,800 pounds of materials and the standard cost for 5,800 pounds of material at six dollars and ten cents per pound okay so this is what the company actually incurred to make X amount of units six thousand pounds and it cost them 550 and this is what the standard says what they want to compare themselves it should have caught it should have taken 5,800 pounds it doesn't tell us the amount of units but this is the standard for that amount of units, whatever this company produced, Myers Corporation, and this would have been the standard price, right? So all I have to do is look at this, and I can see that my negative variance is going to be in materials because I use more materials than I had to, but I'm going to have a positive variance in, in price. So how do we calculate this? Well, let's just start putting the, the data here separately. So my actual um, my actual quantity was six thousand, right? And the actual price was five fifty. And the standard was five thousand eight hundred. And the standard price is six dollars and ten cents. Now all you have to do is apply the formulas, and unfortunately, you know, I'm sorry, but it, yeah, I can't give you any other advice except to memorize the formula. There's, you know, one of the, thing, the things that might confuse you about these formulas is where to put the actual versus the, the standard. Like, for example, in this case, we have actual actual quantity here, you know. But down here, we have standard price. So um, the only advice I could give you is simply memorize the formulas, okay? So direct materials, and these are these are in the PowerPoint slides. They're also in the um, in the review. So what's the direct materials price variance? Let's just simply apply the formula. The direct materials price variance is going to be equal to actual price, which is five fifty, minus standard price, which is six ten. We'll close parentheses there. And then you have to multiply that times actual quantity, which is 6,000, okay? And so we're, we're talking in terms of cost, right? So when it's negative, that means that you had lower cost than anticipated, a lower variance as far as cost goes. So this is favorable, right? Negative is favorable in this case. And it's easy to see. We're talking about price variance here. And your actual price was lower than your standard, so you know it's going to be favorable. Now, what's the dollar amount favorable? Well, the dollar amount is, once you multiply that times the actual quantity, you'll get the full dollar amount favorable. Now, the next question is direct materials quantity variance. We know that we spent more quantity than the standard says. So this should be negative, this should be uh, unfavorable, which is going to be a positive number, meaning you, you incurred a higher cost than you should have. And so we simply go ahead and follow the formula here as well. Actual quantity 6,000 minus 
standard quantity of 5,800. That's 200, and I multiply that times the standard price, which is 610. And so I'm going to have an unfavorable variance of 1,220 there. And so the total variance for when you compare direct materials, um, actual versus direct materials standard without decomposing price and, and quantity variance is simply the addition of both of these, right? Which would be a favorable variance of 2,380 thanks to the fact that you've Paid such a such a lower price than you had anticipated. The standard was six ten. Okay, so that's quite easy. Let's let's move on to the second problem. Second problem. Jake Jackson Corporation has the following data related to direct labor costs. Okay, so we spoke about direct materials in the first problem. Now we're going to talk about direct labor costs. And direct labor costs, the variances can be decomposed into the amount of hours of labor or it could be decomposed into the amount of, of um the, the the amount the salary or the, the hourly wage you paid your um your employees right so actual actual costs are in this case you had nine thousand six hundred of labor hours actual at a cost of fourteen seventy five And the standard, what the expectation, the standard for the industry was for it to be 10,100 hours. So you know you spent less hours. So the hours is going to be a favorable variance. And at 450, well, you paid more than um, you paid more than you had than you anticipated as far as the standard goes, right? So this is going to be a negative variance. So the question is, what is the direct labor time variance okay time variance is here right not not um not labor cost variance so the the variance is going to be let's go ahead and simply ap apply this formula actual direct labors labor minus standard direct labor and we will multiply that times standard rate per hour 1450 and so the answer is 7250 and we know that that is favorable so based on labor hours you were able to save you you were able to save 7250 which is great and it cost you a little more maybe the decision was that you want you you decided to employ um, more efficient more efficiently trained employees and they demanded a higher salary per hour so there's a negative variance here but it was it's it's more than offset by the positive um, uh labor hour variance okay so usually when we analyze this in the real world, you can't take it, um, you can't just look at it one, one, um, one side alone. You have to look at both of them together because they, they truly affect each other, right? You may have more labor hours here, but at a lower cost. And the strategy there would have been um, to hire lower lower level employees maybe they were less efficient and, and they took more hours but you were able to pay them less and so it was offset by the um by the cost per hour okay but anyways the point is you need to memorize these formulas and you need to know when to apply them and if you have them formulas memorized then it's just a matter of applying the numbers it's, it's quite easy So we spoke about um, direct uh, materials variance, direct uh, labor variance, and now let's talk about the fixed fixed overhead variance, okay? It says the standard factory overhead rate is $10 per direct labor hours. Eight of it is for variable factory overhead and two of it is for fixed factory overhead. 
based on a 100% of normal capacity of 30,000 direct labor hours. The standard cost and the actual cost of factory overhead for the production of 5,000 units during May were as follows. So for 5,000 units, um, let's see what happened here. Why don't I have, um, I guess the word standard here is not showing. I don't know why. Anyways, this this is supposed to say standard here. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Standard. Maybe because this isn't wide enough. There you go. Okay, so standard. So the standard um, hours uh, would have been two hundred and sixty thousand dollars. And for 5,000 units, for 6,000 units, it would have been $300,000. Okay, why? How do we, how do we know this? Well, we know that, um, it's $8 per direct labor hour, right? And so, and so it says, uh, normal capacity is 30,000 direct labor hours. So 30,000 times times uh, eight dollars is two hundred and forty thousand of variable and thirty thousand times two is sixty thousand then that would give me a total um, a total standard cost of fixed overhead of three hundred thousand right but if you only produce five thousand units then the standard is going to be different um, you're gonna you're gonna have fixed factory overhead of sixty thousand right because that doesn't change so the two two times thirty thousand is sixty thousand. That doesn't change. But five thousand times the variable factory overhead of eight dollars is going to be two hundred thousand, right? Uh, I'm sorry. Twenty five thousand times eight hours is going to be two hundred thousand, and then you add the sixty thousand of fixed overhead. For a total of two hundred sixty thousand. Okay, so now they're giving us over here the actual. The actual of fix was sixty thousand, and the actual of variable was two hundred and two thousand five hundred. Okay, so like I said, if I decompose this, my variable would have been two hundred thousand, and my fix is sixty thousand. Okay, so I already see that there's a negative um, negative variance as far as the variable overhead goes. What is the amount of fixed factory overhead volume variance? Fixed factory overhead volume variance. So let's do that. Let's do the fixed factory overhead volume variance. You know, even though here we have sixty thousand and here we have sixty thousand, and you might get confused and say. Oh, there's zero variance. The reality is that there's going to be a negative variance. Why? Because for sixty thousand dollars, you could have used that to produce six thousand units. Instead, you produce only five thousand units. So you sort of left some unused capacity, right? So that's the that's the idea behind this formula: fixed factory overhead volume variance, standard hours. For 100% normal capacity is 30,000, right? 30,000 minus standard hours for actual units produced minus 25,000 So that's telling me that I underused 5,000 hours right this should not be dollar sign right but five thousand hours were were underused by my fix based on the fixed um fixed capacity that i had so then i take that and i multiply it by the fixed factory overhead rate so i'll take that and i'll multiply that by two right that's my fixed factory overhead and it's going to be ten thousand dollars that's an unfavorable variance okay as i said it's unfavorable because we underused our fixed overhead capacity by five thousand hours 
weeks. If I tell you, if I tell you, you pay me six thousand dollars. I'm sorry, you pay me sixty thousand dollars, and you can use um, this machine for up to thirty thousand hours. But you only used it for twenty-five thousand hours. Well, you sort of left some money on the table, right? Which isn't good. You didn't make full use of your whole sixty thousand dollars of fixed factory overhead. And that's the logic behind this here. That's why you have a ten thousand dollar unfavorable variance. Now the next question is variable factory overhead controllable variance. This actual factory overhead, which is two hundred two five hundred, minus budgeted factory overhead. So let's calculate budgeted factory overhead. Let's see how we do that. We simply use this formula. So budgeted factory overhead is going to be standard hours for actual units produced, which is going to be equal to standard hours for actual units produced, which is going to be 25000 right, times variable factory overhead, which is $2, times $2. So my budgeted factory overhead is going to be I'm sorry, I used the wrong. It's not $2, it's $8. My budgeted factory overhead is going to be $200,000. Um, but I actually spent two hundred two five hundred. dollars So, my vari variable factory overhead controllable variance is going to be actual minus budgeted. And I have a negative variance, unfavorable variance of there goes my phone. Nobody ever calls me except when I'm doing a video. So I will have an unfavorable um, factory overhead controllable variance of 2,500. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Let's move on to the next um, next problem. So these problems, um, to be quite honest with you, um, I don't. I, you know, I I personally, um, I don't want to say I don't like them, but the, the reality is, you just have to memorize these formulas. I mean, sometimes it, there there is some intuitive sense to this formula, but it's it's hard to come about. And so, if you don't know the formulas, you're going to get all confused, and, and you're not going to find the answer. So, my best advice to you is to memorize the formulas. Unless, and, uh, unlike the next problems that you're going to see a, a, um, later on, where if you do have some uh, analytical ability, you'll be able to solve these other problems without even Without even studying the chapters, I mean, but but you should you should indeed study the chapters. Though. I'm not telling you not to. Morocco Desk Company purchases five thousand feet of lumber at five dollars per foot, right? The standard price for direct materials is four dollars. The entry to record purchases an unfavorable di direct materials price variance is so they want to. The question is, okay, what entries do you do when you separate your favor your your price variance from in your accounting entries? So this is a technique that's used where um, some companies actually um, have a specific line where they show their their variances. And in this case, it's going to be um, what's the variance that we're looking for here? This the price variance, okay? So first thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and we want to calculate our standard cost. Our total standard cost is going to be equal to, you, you're going to use the, the number of feet um, that you actually use times the standard price for that. So in this case, you're going to have 5,000 feet used times the standard price is $20,000. Okay? So that's the standard cost. 
And, you, and that's important to know because how much was the actual cost? Well, the actual cost is going to be 5,000 feet times $5 per unit, right? Let me, let me write that here. Uh, actual cost. Actual cost is going to be equal to 5,000 feet times actual cost, which is uh, $5. Right? $5. And that's going to be equal to 25000 So we know that we have a variance of $5,000, actual versus standard. So we're going to have a variance line here that's going to be um, for $5,000. We're going to separate the variance, right? So first thing, let's do, let's do the actual. Um, direct uh, Morocco Desk Company purchases 5,000 feet of lumber at $5 per foot. The standard price for direct materials is $4. The entry to record the purchase and unfavorable direct material variance is. Okay, so it doesn't really tell me if they purchased it cash or they purchased it on credit. So let's just assume that they purchased it on credit. Okay, so my first entry is going to be Accounts payable, right? Accounts payable for $25,000. And my next entry is going to be uh, based on, the, that. that's based on actual, right? Let's base it on standard cost here. So we bought direct materials. Based on the standard cost, how much of direct materials did we, we buy? Well, based on standard cost, we bought $20,000. In direct materials so our variance or our unfavorable variance is five thousand dollars which we put here in this line and that's a way of directly um, I have separating the price variance when you purchase direct materials so in this so this entry tells me that I bought based on standards twenty thousand dollars of direct materials for $25,000. So I overpaid base on standards $5,000. And so I put that as part of my direct materials price variance. Okay, and that's the entry that you have to do there. Let's take a look at, at another one. This one is um, for Related to, I guess, what type of variance we're looking at here. The, the entry to record the standard direct material. I guess we're looking at direct materials quantity variance here. Yes, it says it here. Direct materials quantity variance. Okay. Now we're going to do something similar to what we did in the prior um, problem. Nestle Corporation produced 4,000 units that require 6 standard pounds per unit. Okay, so 4,000 units requiring 6,000 pounds per unit, the standard pounds is going to be 4,000 times 6, 24,000. That's the standard pounds, okay, for the amount of, um, for, for 4,000 units, okay. The company actually used 25,500. Okay, so now you know that as far as um, pounds goes, quantity variance, it's going to be negative because it's, the standard was 24, the company was 25,500. The entry to record the standard direct materials used in production and direct materials quantity variance is, okay? So we know that the standard pounds that were supposed to be used, well, let's do this first. Let's take a look. Direct materials quantity variance is going to be equal to actual quantity we already said that the actual quantity was 25,500. Let me write that here, 25,500 minus the standard quantity, which is 24,000. And then you're going to go ahead and multiply that times the standard price. And it says that the standard price is $5, okay? So the direct materials price variance is going to be 7500 Okay. 
I'm not 100% sure yet if it's a debit or a credit. I'm a little bit confused. Let's just say. So let's let's go and look at the um, let's look at the other logic. Okay. So why didn't you send to work in pro in process? Right. That's going to be your your um your first account work in process. It says um you take it out of direct materials and you're using it and you're putting it as, as work in process. Um, so what do you use? Well, you're going to go with your actual amount used, right? You use 25500 at $5. So you use 125000 127500 actual pounds times standard price. That's what you actually used. What you should have used based on the standards which comes out of materials, right? You're taking it out of materials. It's 120,000 based on the standard. Standard pounds of 4,000, of 24,000 times standard price of $5. That's 120,000. So the direct materials price variance, which we already calculated, we know is simply the plug here. And it's going to be on the credit side. So direct materials price variance is 7500 So notice that in this technique for accounting, we're separating the variance, we're, we're creating a unique line for the variance. We're putting on the materials, we're taking out what the standard set we should have taken out, and we're putting in work and process the actual amount that was used. Okay, so let's do the next problem. You just have to do these problems various times so that it just becomes natural. Um, the test will be very similar. So as long as you do these problems two or three times, um, you should not have a problem in the test. Okay, so this now, you know, now I'm liking this a little more because this is more logical sense. Um, a person that knows that's good with numbers should be able to um, solve these problems without even opening the chapter. So let's take a look at this. The condensed income statement for Fletcher Inc. for the past year is as follows. So here's here's the numbers for, for Fletcher Inc. It says management is considering the discontinuance of the manufacture and the sale of product G, right? At the beginning of the current year. The discontinuance will have no effect on total fixed costs, meaning that if you eliminate product G, your fixed costs are going to stay the same. It's not going to lower fixed costs. Or on the sales and expenses of products F or H. What is the amount of change in net income for the current year that will result from the discontinuance of product G? So if you're not um, financially inclined or if you don't study, if you haven't studied this, your first intuition is to look at product G and say, well, product G has a loss of $25,000. So let's eliminate it. If I eliminate product G, um, I will, I will, as a company, I will make more money. I'll increase my, my net income from 35000 to, you know, I'll add 25000 So it should, it should be 35 plus 25. I should have 60000 right? So let's see if that's true. Let's come over here and let's just go ahead and, and let's eliminate product G from my numbers. And my sales are going to be lower, right? 725 minus 175. I have $550,000 in sales now if I eliminate product G. Uh, my variable cost will be lower, right? 560 minus 160. I have 400,000. Are fixed costs going to be lower? The answer to that question is no. Fixed costs will not be lower because remember what it says here. The discontinuance will have no effect on total fixed costs, meaning that if you eliminate product G, this $40,000 here will now have to be absorbed by product F or product H. Look at it this way. Let's just say that I'm allocating $130,000 of rent expense, a fixed cost. I pay $130,000 of rent and I'm allocating it between these three products, right? If I eliminate product G, I still have to pay $130,000 in rent. So it's not going to alleviate my expense there. 
I'm simply going to have to allocate this $40,000 between these two products now. But my total fixed cost will not change. So my total fixed cost is $130,000. Okay? Which means that my total cost is five thirty, dollars And my net income is going to be equal to five fifty minus five thirty is twenty thousand dollars right so i actually lowered my income by eliminating product g from thirty five thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars right it says what is the amount of change in net income well the amount of change in net income is a reduction of fifteen thousand dollars well that's not good right you don't so you don't want to eliminate product g in this case another way to look at it is this way your fixed cost for product G is $40,000, right? Your net loss for product G is $25,000. So what this is telling me is at least product G is lowering your a fixed an expensive fixed cost. It's lowering it by $15,000, right? By having product G here, you can at least lower this fixed cost of $40,000 by $15,000. If you take product G out, that benefit will go away. So, you're going to lower your overall income by $15,000. Okay, so you could do it either way. You could do it that this way, step by step, to see what your effect on net income is going to be. Or you could simply look at it here. Here I can see clearly, I have $40,000 of fixed cost that is not going to go away. My my net income or loss for product G is twenty five thousand dollars. That means that product G somehow, through sales and variable costs, was able to bring down fixed costs by fifteen thousand dollars. So it did give me some benefit. So should I keep product G? Yes. If you don't keep product G, your costs, all other things equal, your net income is going to go down by $20,000 because product F and product H will have to carry that $40,000 in fixed income that, car that product G is carrying right now. Okay? So that's the idea behind that exercise. And this is just mathematical logic. This is the type of exercise that I like. You don't have to memorize formulas or anything. You just have to understand the logic behind this analysis, okay? And the basic logic behind this analysis is that fixed costs do not go away. When you make a decision, you have to make it in light of the fact that fixed costs are not going to go away. Okay, so let's look at this problem. This relates to... Um, uh, the decision of whether to purchase a product or to make it um, yourself or the company, okay? So let's read this one. Sage Company is operating at 90% of capacity. So if it's operating at 90% capacity, that means that it has 10% capacity to perhaps um, uh, uh, make some product, right? So they have 10% um uh, machinery or whatever it is that they're not using. So they could use this and, and maybe make the product rather than purchase it. And it's currently purchasing a part used in its manufacturing operations for $20 per unit. Okay, so the purchase price is um, $20 per unit. The unit cost for the business to make the part is $25. So it's costing them $25 to make if, if they decided to make it, right? So based on this decision, you would absolutely not want to, um, you would not want to, uh, sorry. You would not want to go ahead and, um, and make the product. However, um, we need to decompose it into the fixed component, which we're going to, um, expense anyways, and the variable component. The unit cost for business to make their part is $25, including fixed costs. Now, those, those fixed costs are going to be costs that you're going to incur regardless of whether um, you make the product or not. Okay? So those fixed costs are related to the costs um, that they're not using, but they're fixed. They're not going to go away. And, variable, and, and $13 is not including fixed costs. 
So $13 is the variable component. So if the variable component is $13, that means that the fixed component is going to be the difference, right? Uh, $12. So like I said, fix in these analysis, fix is, 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 is an expense that's allocated, but it's going to be there regardless of whether you make the product or not. So you're not, we're not going to use it in the decision making process. Um, this is going to be the incremental cost, $13. So that's what we're going to make base our decision on. It says if 30,000 units of the part are not which are normally purchased during the year, but could be manufactured using unused capacity. In other words, this 10% that you're not using, you're going to be able to use it now. Okay. What would be the amount of differential cost increase or decrease from making the part rather than purchasing it? So we're going to produce 30,000 units, right? The incremental cost to make this, it would be 30,000 units. You're not going to, it's not, the $12 of fixed cost is not going to be incremental, okay, because that's already there. It's wasted. It's wasted um, cost that we incur, but we're not using because we're running at 90% capacity. The incremental cost only relates to the $13 of variable cost. So we multiply 13 times 30,000. Um, sorry, let's just put this here. So the 13 is the incremental cost, right, the variable component. So what's the total incremental cost? 13 times 30, right? That's going to be my total incremental cost if I decide to make the product, which is going to be a cost of $390,000, right? That's what it would cost me incrementally if I make 30,000 units. If I purchase the product, it's going to be 30,000 times the purchase price which is going to be 600,000, right? So we'll take the $20 and we'll multiply it times the 30,000, that's 600,000. So if I make the product rather than purchase it, I will save myself $210,000 in cost. So the question is, what would be the amount of differential cost increase or decrease from making the part rather than purchasing it? There will be an incremental cost, differential cost decrease of $210,000. So the decision here would be that you would rather um, make it than purchase it, right? And the key here is that fixed costs are costs that you're incurring anyway, so they, they're not going to... Um, be accounted for in this comparison and in this decision. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's do the next one. Hopefully this one will go a little smoother. <laughs> Lara Technologies is considering a cash outlay of $200,000 for the purchase of land. Okay. Which it could lease out for $25,000 per year. So they're going to get $25,000 per year. Let's just put it there. If alternative investments are available at a 12% return, the opportunity cost of the purchase of the land is, the opportunity cost is whatever, you know, whatever opportunity you have under an alternative investment. So it's telling me my alternative investment is to invest the two hundred thousand dollars in something that in an investment that's going to yield me twelve percent. So my opportunity cost is going to be equal to two hundred thousand times twelve percent is twenty four thousand. So my opportunity cost, all other things being equal, we're not accounting for risk or anything else. Let's just assume everything else is equal. It's just equally risky and all that part. I can invest my $200,000 in, let's say, some sort of investment. Let's just say it's a, it's a bond. It's, I'm going to earn $24,000. Otherwise, I can simply um, purchase land and lease it and earn $25,000. So the choice would be this one, right? Assuming 
which is not usually the case, assuming everything else is equal as far as risk and so forth, because you're going to get a higher return. So if the risk is the same and the time of the, of the cash flows are the same, then obviously you would go with the project that earns you $25,000 more. The opportunity cost, the alternative investment, is $24,000, which is lower. So in this case, you would reject the, um, the alternative project and you would take the initial project of purchasing the land and leasing it. And again, let me stress, this is a very simple example. Typically, it, you don't analyze it like this. You'll take a look at, you know, you have to incorporate the riskiness of each project here. But let's just assume in this case that um, the risk and everything else is equal. All other things are equal. Okay, let's take a look at this next problem. Problem 9. Keating Company is considering selling equipment that costs $60,000 and has $50,000 of accumulated depreciation to date. Okay? Keating Company can sell the equipment through a broker, or this is, I guess, a sell or lease. Um, question can sell the equipment to a broker for twenty thousand dollars okay so they're gonna sell they could sell it for twenty thousand uh, dollars they're gonna they're gonna pay a five percent commission so the commission is going to be equal to twenty thousand times five percent is a thousand dollars so they're going to bring in a net of nineteen thousand dollars right nineteen thousand dollars if they if they sell the equipment okay so what's going to happen under the alternative it says gunner has offered to lease the equipment from keating for five years for twenty eight thousand seven fifty so they could lease the equipment for twenty eight thousand seven fifty keating will incur the repair, insurance, and property tax expenses of $8,000. So that's, Keating can lease it for $28,750, but they need to incur the expenses. So you need to take that out from their gross payment, right? And so their net is going to be $27,750. The net differential income for the lease alternative is, well, the net differential income is going to be simply the twenty-seven fifty minus the nineteen thousand, and that's going to be one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, so that's the answer to that. Again, this problem is ignoring various things. For, for example, in this situation you get your nineteen thousand dollars up front in the current period whereas in this situation even though it looks better you're gonna you you get installment payments for three years right or for five years so in essence really what you have to do is you bring have to bring these dollars down to present value because we all know that a dollar today is worth a lot more than a dollar four or five years from now right so we're not using the present value concept that's beyond the scope of this course. We're just making it very simple. We're just making a very simple comparison of one alternative versus the other. This alternative, um, ignoring present value of a dollar, um, turns out to 20,750. This alternative turns out to 19,000. So the differential income is 1,750. Okay. Let's do the next problem. Nighthawk Inc. is considering disposing of a machine with a book value of $21,000 and estimated life, estimated, and an estimated remaining life of three years. Okay? And right off the bat, I'll tell you right now that these problems are giving you book values and this type of stuff. It's just, I guess what we're trying to stress here is, is that here we're doing economic 
and financial uh, analysis. Book value is meaningless. What matters is actual cash inflows and outflows. Okay, so let's take a look at that. The old machine can be sold for five thousand dollars, right? So cash inflow is five thousand dollars if you sell the machine. It says a new machine which with a purchase price of sixty eight thousand seven fifty is being considered as a, as a re replacement. So you're going to have a purchase price, a cash outflow of sixty eight thousand seven fifty, right? So how much is purchasing this uh, new machine going to help me? Well, it says, it is estimated that the annual variable manufacturing cost will be reduced from $39,750 to $20,000, right? So every year, I'm going to have a reduction of the cost of $39,750, right? Minus twenty thousand. My reduction in variable cost is nineteen thousand seven fifty. So we'll put that as a cash inflow, right? Positive cash inflow because you're saving that money, and it's going to be for three years. So we'll go here and we'll go nineteen seven fifty. We'll multiply it times three, and that's the total that you are saving it says um okay and that's the total that you are saving right so as far as variable cost savings so you're going to have a cash inflow of five thousand you're going to have a savings of fifty nine thousand two fifty but the machine is going to cost you sixty-eight thousand seven fifty. So let's add this up, and you're gonna still end up with a negative cash, um, a negative cash outflow of four thousand five hundred. So under this scenario, you're probably better off just staying with the old machine, because the new machine is not gonna save you enough to warrant purchasing it. Okay, so the key here is to to take a look at the inflows and outflows. Inflows also include the savings, right? This is an actual cash inflow of five thousand dollars when you sell the machine. This is um, the net savings of purchasing the machine as far as variable cost. So you're going to have fifty nine thousand two hundred and fifty um, dollars in variable cost that that you will not, that you will have reduced but you have to pay 68750 for the machine so overall you're still losing 4500 so in this case the decision would be to stay with the old machine right now if the now if the the new machine would have cost us uh, let's say 58750 Then the decision is different, right? Sorry. 58,750. Then the decision is different. Right? Now, you have a net profit of 5,500. And the decision is, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll buy the new machine. It's worth it for me. I'll save 59,250, which is a lot more than the machine cost from the beginning. And on top of that, I can sell my own machine for five thousand dollars. So it's it, for me, it's worth it. And I'll go ahead and I'll buy the new machine. Okay, next one. Yasmin Company can further. This is this is um the decision to either process further, or to simply sell at um at a specific point, and not continue to process. Okay. So it says, Yasmin Company can further process product B to produce product C. Okay, it says product B is selling for $25. So I could sell product B for, for $25. It costs me $23 to produce product B. So my margin for product B is positive, right? 
25 minus 23 is two dollars at this point i could sell product b to somebody else or i could process it further into product c okay if i process it into product c product c is going to sell for fifty dollars that's good i got a higher selling price right i doubled my selling price from 25 to 50. the problem is i'm sure it's going to cost me some money to process it from from point from product b to product c so how much is it going to cost me it's going to cost me an additional 26 dollars right so if it costs me so the differential revenue is going to be good right 50 minus 25 that's good i got a nice differential revenue but the differential cost is going to be an additional $26. Well, that's not good. Because ultimately then, I end up losing $1 in this decision. Right? I, I will be losing $1 in my mar in margin by, by making this decision. Right? My total product... My total product um, revenue is going to be 50. And my total product cost is going to be equal to 26 plus 23, right? Because it says an additional 26. So it's going to be 49. And so I'll make a margin. I'll make a profit margin per unit of one dollar but why would I want to do that if I was already making if I was making a higher profit margin per unit up here so it's it's not gonna help me to to process it into product C I'd rather just sell it to probably a more efficient processor another company that specializes in taking this from product B to product C and I will sell it at this stage where I can make two dollars per unit rather than making one dollar per unit if I um, if I continue the process right so this is um, this would be the final sorry this would be the final um, outcome if you continue to process the cost would be 49 and the margin would be one you don't have to do it this way. You can just look at the differential situation. You're going to have a differential revenue of 25, right? You sold this one from 25 to 50. You'll have a differential revenue of 25, incremental revenue of 25. Well, what's going to be your incremental cost or incremental or differential cost? It's going to be 26. It says it here. So that's not good. So going forward and processing to product C is going to cause a loss and a loss of one dollar and it's going to reduce your margin by one dollar from what you did previously so the decision here would be to um, stop at, at the stage B and sell the product at stage B to some other um, manufacturer so that, that other manufacturer could process it further the other manufacturer is probably a more efficient manufacturer um, as far as taking the product from stage B to stage C. Let's do the next problem. Falcom Company produces a single product. Its normal selling price is $25. Okay, so the normal selling price is $25 per unit. The variable cost per unit is 14 Okay, so the contribution margin is 25 minus 14 is 11 and the fixed cost for 5,000 units fixed costs are $20,000 for 5,000 units okay so now you get a special order this says Falcon received a request for a special order that would not interfere with its normal sell, set, uh, sales okay with these sales up here it's not going to interfere the order was for 1,250 units, okay? 1,250 units. And 
its special price is going to be $18. And the variable cost per unit, it says, what's a, it says Falcon has the capacity to handle the special order. And for this order, a variable selling cost of $1 per unit will be eliminated. Good. So the variable selling cost actually decreases for whatever reason. It doesn't explain it, but for whatever reason, producing these additional 1,250 units, somehow they eliminate some sort of variable cost. Okay. Maybe the percent commission that's paid to the salesperson decreases at this level or something like that. So the contribution margin is going to be $5, right? And so the impact on net income is going to be equal to 5 times 1,250 is 6250. If the order is accepted, what would be the impact on net income? Well, the impact on net income is 6250 and the order should be accepted, right? Remember, this is excess capacity that was not used before. Obviously, you're not going to go this route if you can continue to sell and make margins of $11. But this, but this order here would only occur if you could sell at $18 and will not affect the sales at the, at $25. So in this case, that's what makes it a special order. So you would go ahead and accept this one-time order um, and earn an extra $6,250. Now as a company, these are just numbers, but as a company you have to um, take into consideration well, let's just make sure if I do this special order that my customers that are paying $25 for the unit price don't find out because they're going to be very upset at me as a company, right? Um, and um, so I have to be very cautious that I do not um, proceed and continue that I do this on a, on a special case basis, number one, and that I don't get too lazy and start selling more at $18 and start um, sort of um, eating up at the $25 uh, selling price up here and eating up and competing with my own margin, right, up here. So this can be done, but keep into consideration that it's a one-time thing that the company wants to do, and they probably want to keep it very hidden from the rest of their uh, customers up here that would be uh, very unhappy if they found out that um, somebody was able to purchase it for $18, right? Okay. So let's do the next problem. This problem um, has, this is three problems in one, okay? And this is related to using the product cost concept of product pricing. Okay, so let's see how this is done because this um, incorporates three problems in, in one or maybe even four. I'm not even sure. I have four boxes here, so there might be four problems in one. Okay, so this is a way that companies determine how much they want to pr uh, price their product and it's called the product cost concept. So let's read right here. It says Mallard Corporation uses the product cost concept of product pricing. Below is cost information for the production and sale of 45,000 units of its sold product. Mallard desires a profit equals to 12% return on invested assets of $800,000. Okay, so Mallard invested $800,000 in this company and they, they, they want a 12% return. Okay, so let's see what's the desired process. Profit, sorry. If I invested $800,000 and I want a return of 12%, I'm sorry, you see, I didn't change, I should have changed the number up here. It's 11% based on. Because I, I took these problems straight from the straight from the test actually and and um, changed the numbers on them. So it's eleven percent. So the return that they want is eighty eight thousand dollars, right? This is 
800,000 times 11%. So they want a profit of $88,000, okay? So how do I obtain? So I'm going to use this information to determine what, how I'm going to price my product. But first, let me determine what's my cost per unit, okay? So how much units am I going to produce? Uh, it says it up here, right? It says, uh, again, I forgot to update this, these numbers. This should be 40,000 units. It says I produce 40,000 units, okay? And my fixed factory overhead cost per unit is going to be, well, I'm going to take Fixed factory overhead is a total dollar seventy five thousand divided by forty thousand units. That's going to be a dollar eighty eight. Okay, see how I got that? Fixed factory overhead cost is given to me, and that's a product cost, right? This is a product cost, and these are product costs. Remember how under absorption costing, the product costs were direct materials. Direct labor, variable direct materials, variable direct labor, and both variable and fixed overhead. So fixed and variable. So we're, we're sort of treating this like absorption costing. So first let's determine the variable, the fixed factory overhead per unit. At 40,000 units, $75,000 total fixed factory overhead is $1.88 per unit. And what's my total variable product cost per unit? Well, that's very simple. We simply take these. So all, all I'm doing here is I'm creating a, a, a product cost per unit using all the product cost categories up here. So the variable product cost per unit is going to be 5 plus 7 plus 2. Okay? And that's going to be uh, $14, right? So my total cost per unit is simply the 188 plus the 14, and that should be 1588. So these are my cost per unit, okay? My cost per unit. Desired profit is going to be $88,000, right? Fixed selling and administrative cost is going to be, now let's take, let's see how much I want to cover as far as to, the total cost that I need to co cover with each, with, with my contribution margin, right? So, I need to I need to cover my profit. I need to cover anything that's not a product cost, which is this one here, right? I need to cover this. That's not a product cost, as you can see. And I need to cover the variable selling and administrative cost per unit, which is not a product cost either. It's variable, but it's not a product cost. So I'm going to take 90 cents, and I'm going to multiply it times 40,000, and that's going to be 36,000. So these are the three costs that my margin must cover. Okay? My margin must cover a total of $164,000 in costs, right? So the total product cost is going to be equal to 40,000 40, units times $15.88, right? Because product cost per unit is $15.88. If I produce 40,000, my product is going to cost me 635,000. So then the question becomes, okay, my product is going to cost me 635,000 to produce and I want an additional 164,000 to cover my fixed selling and administrative costs, my variable selling and administrative costs, and my desired profit. Okay? So what percentage do I have to sell over the 635 in order to get that? So that's pretty easy, right? Because all you do is you take the 164 that you need to cover over your product cost, and that's going to give you the percentage. So your product cost, your sales price must be 25.83% higher 
than your product cost in order to have a profit of 88,000 in order to cover these two which would be like my like the fixed cost and to earn a profit of $88,000. So you simply apply the 25.83% to the unit selling price. And that's going to be equal to so my unit selling price is going to be 1588 times 1. Point, uh so it's 2583 again I apologize, I did not change this number here. This number should be 12583. I thought I had changed that, but I guess I didn't. And so this is going to be equal to 1998. Okay? And that's the price that you want to sell it at. Okay, 1998. Let me go back and let me see if 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 this ties. Okay, so if I sell my my product my forty thousand units at 1988, I will have a total sales of. Right, this is going to be my sales of seven ninety nine. What's going to be my product cost or my cost of goods sold? Let's just put cost of goods sold. Well, my cost of goods sold we already know was fifteen eighty eight per unit, right? So this is going to be this times forty thousand. Okay. That's the 635, right? We had already calculated that. And this here is going to be my manufacturing margin. Manufacturing margin. Let me just put uh, MM. Sorry, MM. Manufacturing margin, right? So my manufacturing margin is going to be 799 minus minus 635 is going to be 164 okay that 164 is going to help cover my variable selling and administrative expense right variable selling and administrative expense of let's say 36,000 right that's what it says here variable selling is 36,000 Let me give it the same thing. And what do we call this? That we once we subtract this, that's one twenty-eight. What do we call that? We call this contribution margin, right? That's my contribution margin. My contribution margin is going to help me cover fixed cost, and then whatever is left over is going to be my profit, right? My desired profit. So let's see if this works out. So my 128 is going to help me cover my fixed cost here, which is 40,000. And what I have left over is 88,000. So that, see, so that's how I get to my desired profit. So that's how I price a product under this concept, right? First, you want to see how much you want in profit. Okay, so I invested $800,000 and I want 11% profit. So I want my profit to be $88,000. Okay, so I'm going to produce 40,000 units. I'm going to produce 40,000 units. And those 40,000 units are going to um, have a variable cost, product cost of 1588 per unit right we take it from up here it's given to us fixed factory overhead variable direct materials variable direct labor and variable factory overhead these are all given to us um and so and we do it on a per unit basis right the 75,000 is dollar 88 and these are already given to us in a per unit basis so we just add it so it's 1588 
right? We want this 1588 per unit has to cover my desired profit plus my two um, non-product cost, fixed selling and administrative and variable selling and administrative, okay? So what are those? That's 40,000 here, which is given to me. This one I need to multiply times 40,000 units because it's given to me on a per unit basis, 36. So I want it, so I want my, my product cost to be, a, I want my um, sales price to be $164,000 over my product cost. That way I can cover all my costs and have a profit of 88,000. So we determine what that is on a percentage basis. So what is 164 of 635? That's 25.83%. So now you take your cost and you increase it by 25.83. You do it like this. 5.88 times 1.2583 is 1998. So that's my selling price. It's gonna, now my selling price is going to be 25.83% above my unit cost. And that's going to help me obtain total sales that will help cover these costs and earn me my desired profit of $88,000, okay? Okay, so let me do a next, uh, the next problem. We have two more to go, and we should be done. By the way, this was probably the longest. The next two are going to be shorter. Flyer Company sells a product in a competitive marketplace. Market analysis indicates that its product will probably... This is a different way of, um, of, uh, of determining your product price, right? The first way we started was called uh, product cost concept. This one we're going we're gonna to call target cost concept, right? So let me start again. Flyer Company sells a product in a competitive marketplace. Market analysis indicates that its product will probably sell at $36 per unit. Flyer, Flyer Management desires a 10% profit margin. Their current full cost for the product is $34 per unit. Okay? So... Let's see how we do this. If the company meets the new target cost number, how much will it have to cut cost per unit, if any? Okay. We, well, it says 30, current cost is $34. Okay. $34 is my current cost. What's the profit margin that I want? Well, I want a profit margin of 10%. Okay. And it says, let's see, market indicates that a product will probably sell for $36 per unit. So it says I could sell this for $36 per unit. So you're going to work your way backwards. You're in, in this one, you had your cost and you determined your sales price. In this one, you have your sales price and you're going to determine your cost. So if you know you could sell it for $36 and you want to have a profit margin of 10%, that's telling me what's 10% of 30, of 36. Well, 10% of 36 is going to be equal to $3.60, right? So this is the profit margin that you want, 10% of 36, which means that the cost that you're going to, that you, that you're targeting to create your product is going to be, sorry. It's going to be 3240. That's the target cost, right? If you can sell it for 36 and you want a 10% margin, that means that you want a margin of 360. For that to occur, you need to be able to produce this item at $32.46. Oh, but your current cost is $34, which means that you're, you need to try to decrease cost by $1.60 if you want to obtain your target Plus. And that's another way of approaching it. Rather than building up to the sales price as you did here, you're going to have a sales price and you're going to determine what your cost is, the cost that you want. Okay? So now let's do the last one. And you will have a review of all the problems that will be on the test. 
Peyton Company manufactures Phone X and Phone Y. Peyton can sell all it can make of either. Okay? It can sell all it can make of either. Based on the following data, assume the number of hours is a constraint. You could sell all that you can of either, but you only have a certain amount of hours to make um, either one of the product or a combination of both, right? So, how are you going to proceed? Well, let's let's do an analysis. I could sell product X for forty-five dollars, and it has a variable cost of thirty-eight. And I could sell product Y for thirty-four dollars, and it has a variable cost of twenty-two. Product X takes me five hours to produce a unit, and product Y takes me seven dollars. Right. So first things first, let's look at the profit margin of product X. Product X has a profit margin of $7. Product Y has a profit margin of 12 So in this case, you will be inclined to say product Y, or oh, I'll choose product Y, right? Um, because I have a profit margin of 12 But let's take a look at this. It's going to take you more to produce product Y, 7 hours versus 5. So and you only have certain amount of hours. It says here the number of hours is a constraint. You don't know how many hours you have, but you have a certain amount of hours to produce your products, okay? So, the next thing that you have to do will, is you simply calculate a profit margin per hour, and, in, and that will tell you which is the most profitable product to produce. Profit margin per hour for this one would simply be taking seven dollars and dividing it by five right and in that case you have a profit margin per hour of a dollar forty in this case if you divide twelve by seven you have a profit margin of a dollar seventy one so still product y would be your choice but this is the right way to proceed right because if it because if it took you let's see if i change this to eight well, that still gives you product Y, but let's see if I change it to 9. Okay, so if it took you 9 hours to produce product Y, it doesn't matter that the profit margin is higher, 12. It's taking you a lot of time to produce each unit. So it's gonna, so the profit margin per hour is $1.33. In that case, you would choose product X, right? Because you have a higher profit margin per hour, and you'll be able to produce more units of X Remember, it says here you can sell everything that you produce of either one. So you don't have to worry about that. So you produce more units of X. It's going to be a lower profit margin, but you'll, you'll be able to produce more and sell more. So in this case, what you want to do is you want to calculate a profit margin per hour. Okay? So this video took an hour and 20 minutes. It's not that long. It's worth viewing it once or maybe twice. Um, and maybe even more until you understand the problems um, because these problems are very, very strongly correlated to what will be on the test. Okay? Thank you. Any questions, just send them to me. And remember, um, this is not all the test. There's going to be conceptual questions. So look at the exam, at the review, and you'll know what to study as far as, concept, uh, as concepts go. Thank you.